there we go okay so let's do a bit of review and let's talk about the big O notation let's do a few examples Jafar told me that he had trouble understanding and getting uh, a full grasp of the big O notation which is fine I don't expect you to immediately understand it it's a uh, slightly complicated topic but uh, because it's mathematically technical and it's also a bit you know slightly notation wise it's a bit counterintuitive but um, the concept is very intuitive so let's look at the definition and I will do a few examples for you so that you have a better understanding of what really is going on okay so the definition is as follows we're just recapping the definition it just says that we say that a function f of x is big O of g of x if the following condition holds if for all x greater than k the condition the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to c times some constant times the absolute value of g of x and this is the definition and it only means that this statement is asserting that if there are these two constants if you can show that these two constants exist that after your x becomes bigger than this value the absolute value of this function will always be less than this thing so in other words when we say f of x is a big O of g of x we're basically saying that g of x is an upper bound for f of x and so here is a list of common functions which are big O of each other so we saw the graph before and the graph basically told us that this is the sequence of functions such that the constant function is in the big O of the logarithmic function which is then in the big O of polynomial functions which are then big O of exponential functions and then finally you have the factorial function so as you go along in this list you're getting a bigger and bigger function so this is an upper bound for this function this is an upper bound for this function this is an upper bound for this function and so you're getting higher and higher upper bounds and how does this relate to your algorithm it relates to algorithms because when you want to express the running time or computational complexity of an algorithm in terms of the input so it relates to algorithms in that x is the size of input and f of x is the um, let's say num number of steps or complexity or whatever so f of x is the is rather some measure of the execution time or the number of steps or whatever you want to quantify it as whatever you think is a nice um, measure of the complexity of your algorithm okay and so we have a few basic rules which are so the first few basic rules are as follows we can show them as well but uh, and they've been shown in the books as well I'm not going to go on and express each of these we'll just use them as rules for now so the first rule is that if you have constants d bigger than c bigger than one let's suppose then x to the power c is big O of x to the power d this is the rule that says that lower degree polynomials lower degree polynomials are bounded above by higher degree polynomials 
and of course the converse is not true that is xt is not big O xc so a lower degree polynomial cannot be an upper bound for a higher degree polynomial of course it can be a lower bound but it can't be a upper bound the next rule is and you can show this as well you can take any we've done an example where we showed for example that um, x squared was big O of x cubed and you can show this using the definition I won't do this right now we'll do some other examples once we're done with the rules okay the next rule says that if b is bigger than 1 and d is bigger than c is bigger than 0 then the logarithm of x to the base b raised to the power c is big O of d which basically tells us that all logarithms all logarithmic functions are bounded above sorry not big O of d big O of x to the let me write this again big O of x to the power d and this says that all logarithmic functions are bounded above by polynomial functions so if you have any logarithmic function any logarithmic function it will be bounded above by a uh, polynomial function and rather I don't think it's necessary that d should be bigger than c let me just confirm that okay perfect all right so yeah as I was saying you don't need d to be bigger than c you just need d and c to be some positive constants so if you have any logarithmic function it will be bounded above by a polynomial function for example um, if I can example log of x to the power 3 is going to be big O of and you can pick any d over here you can pick x you can pick big O x squared you can pick big O x cubed and log of x whole raised to the power 3 is going to be big O of x big O of x squared big O of x cubed right <clears throat> which one of these um, this is all true this is also true this is also true but when you're talking about algorithms and upper bounds for example if you're selling your algorithm to someone and you're saying the maximum bound of this function is x and x squared and x cubed you want to tell them the smallest bound possible so even though the upper bound is x upper bound is also x squared upper bound is any polynomial function you will tell them that you know in fact it's the upper bound that you will tell them you will tell, try to tell them the smallest upper bound possible so that the worst case scenario that you're giving them is as small as possible so that your algorithm looks as efficient as possible right and in fact you can even show that this function log x whole cube is also you can just say log x cube is also just big O of log of x this is true as well so these rules are true Okay. Thank you. So, in fact, you can say that log x cubed is big O of log x, but we'll be using these rules to provide as small upper bounds as possible. Okay, what's the next rule? The next rule is that if you have let's suppose c bigger than b then b to the power x is big o of c to the power x which is saying that
which is saying that lower exponentials are bounded above by higher exponentials. Okay, Maham has a question. So shouldn't we have d as a value greater than 3? No, Maham, for the previous rule where you had logarithms bigger than polynomials, you don't need for d to be bigger than c. They just need to be constants. These just need to be positive constants. What I wrote before was wrong. The d doesn't need to be bigger than c. It can be any d as long as you know these are positive constants. So I can pick d to be 1, d to be 2, and d to be 3. Any d works. And you can check it out. You can um, you know, take, open a graphing calculator like Desmos, or you can try to graph it yourself. And check graph log of x, whole cubed, versus the function x. And you will see, and you can see that you can give it some value such that after some x greater than k, this function will be smaller than this function. So this will overtake eventually, even if it's smaller um, in the earlier stages. After some point, this function is going to outgrow this, and that's guaranteed. You can try this out. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Sure, I can show it. Let me bring up Desmos. Okay, let me add another window here. Window. Here we go. So we have log x raised to the power 3. And let's suppose I have the function x. You can see immediately that this log add from x has no chance of even, even at the start, even after x greater than 0 exists, x is bigger. right? And you can increase any power. You can say 4, 5, 6, 7. You see it's starting to grow bigger but it still isn't any match for the x function. And perhaps if I set down, huh, I wonder how I can write, all right. So let's add another base, okay? And let's say I have this function. So now you see it's gone a bit out of control, but we can still bring it down under x. And let's see how we can do that. Let's put on, dum, 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 where is it? Okay, where did my window go? There we go. Right, so if I put in three, well, still smaller, let's add another constant. Let's say, make this constant 11. Okay, it's becoming bigger. Let's make another constant 1,000. Okay, so now you see if you make this constant to be 1,000, this function still outgrows. Maybe I don't need 1,000. Maybe I can put in 500. Maybe 50. 50 works. So you see if you have 50x, and over here you had log base 3 and 7, there is still a constant that I can find such that x is bigger than this function. Does that make sense? Joseph? Yes, Jaffer, you have a question? Why are we adding constants? We are adding constants because, here's the, let's go back to the definition. Let's get rid of this Desmos window. And let's go back to this. 
we are adding constants Jaffer because it the definition states that it's big O as long as you can find some constant C and some constant K. So even if without the constant your function is smaller, you are allowed to find a constant. You can make C to be 50, 100. And as long as you can find a constant such that eventually this function outgrows this function, then it's big O of G of X. Does that make sense? Because in some cases, you can't even find a constant. So let's bring up Desmos again, right? Let's say if I want to find in the rule, it was written because you notice that in the rule, what we had was actually, it wasn't, it was saying it's big O of X to the power D. And when you say big O, then the definition of big O is already there because the definition of big O asserts that these two constants exist. Great. So let's just to drive that point home, consider the following. Let's say I was asserting, let's look at an example where x to the power d is not big O of x to the power c, which means if I take a higher polynomial, let's go to the graphing calculator, and let's suppose I take a higher polynomial, let's say x to the power 5, all right, and let's make it smaller so that it fits, x to the power 3, and let's hide these functions, okay. So the red one is x to the power 3, and the blue one is just x. Now, I know that x cubed is not big O of x, which means no matter how much I try, no matter how much, how many constants, whatever constants I try putting here, let's say I put a very big constant 400, and let's, okay, that has gone beyond. So 4, I've put in the constant 40, now, notice that the green function has become bigger than the red function, but it's not true for every x greater than this value. So if I go up a bit and I notice that after some k, x to the 3 takes over from the red function takes over from the green function, which means notice that when I say that x to the power d is not big O of c. So for example, x cube is not big O of x, which means there does not exist constants k and c such that x greater than k would guarantee that x cube is less than some c times x. You can't find this c because after some value of k, this x cube is going to get bigger eventually. You can even try a bigger value. Let's suppose 40, I make it 50. I'm not taking it to 400 because it will uh, become too large and I'll have to go zoom out too much. But you see, even if I increase the constant, it became bigger, but after some point, the red function still takes over. And so this is true for any constant. If you make 50 to be 500, the red function will eventually take over from the green function. So a higher degree polynomial is not bounded above by a lower degree polynomial. Is that, does that make sense now? So, okay, Maham says, so sir, in log functions, before we declare a big O of something, we have to change bases and also check. Um, not really, because when we did the rule, so the rule stated that it works for any B. It works for any B, right? And so if it works for any B, you're guaranteed that whatever the base is, your polynomial function will eventually take over. And you can check in Desmos and you can find constants and you can find k. 
sure I can speak louder. I can actually raise the volume of the mic. How about now? Great. Okay, so that was the idea. Are there any more questions? No, no more questions. Let's move on. So we have another rule that says that lower degree exponentials are in the big O of higher degree exponentials, which means 2 to the power x. So let me just put this away. This was an example that we were doing. And now we are here. So 2 to the x is big O of 3 to the x. 3 to the x is big O of 3.1 to the x and so on. But of course 3 to the x is not big O of 2 to the x. So it's again like polynomials. So lower exponentials are going to be upper bounded by higher exponentials. And finally we have that exponentials so let's say c is a constant c is a positive constant c is bigger than zero so exponentials c to the x are upper bounded by the factorial function so if you have any exponential function this c can be any number it can be thousand two thousand twenty thousand but even if you have ten thousand to the power x it's going to be in the big O of x factorial because eventually x factorial is going to take over the exponential function. So for any exponential functions, all exponentials are bounded above by the factorial function. So if we combine these rules, this gives us again the sequence. So you have the constant function, then the next class is logarithmic functions, which are then, we know that all logarithms are bounded by polynomials. And we know that all polynomials are bounded by exponentials. And we know that all exponentials are bounded by the factorial function. So this is a rough sequence of functions in ascending order. Does that make sense? Let's do an example now. We have a list of functions. We have f1 to be 8 root n. We have f2 to be log n whole squared. We have 2 times n log n which is f of 3 we have the factorial function n factorial we have the exponential function 1.1 to the power x and we have the last function as x squared so these are six functions and our task is to arrange them in such a way that the next function, um, the preceding function is big O of the next function, right? So we have to write them in sort of ascending order so that they become bigger and bigger and bigger 
upper bounds for the previous function. Okay, so if we take a look at this list, we have some idea that constants are followed by x logarithms, which are followed by polynomials, which are followed by exponentials, which are followed by factorials. So if we have any constant function, that's going to be the lowest class. If we have any factorial function, it's going to be the largest class. And we can arrange the orders accordingly. So now we have a factorial function and there's no other factorial function. So we know for a fact that this function is going to be my largest function. So I know I can immediately put it at the head of the list. After we don't have any constant functions here, so we can now take logarithmic function and see if we have any logarithmic functions. We do have a logarithmic function which is log n whole squared and so I can put it at the start of the list log n whole squared which is then followed by polynomial functions and so polynomials, let's see what polynomials we have. We have 8 square root n. We have uh, x squared. And we have, that's it. So we have 8 square root n. We have x squared. Now notice that we have this function n log n. Where do we put this function? It's a polynomial function with degree 1 but it's also multiplied by a logarithmic function. And if you recall, we did an example in the previous uh, class, which was that n log n is actually going to be bigger than somewhat. So if we have, rather I'll just tell you right now and we can look at it later. So we have n log n is going to be after n but before n squared. So it's bigger than the first degree polynomial and smaller than a second degree polynomial. So essentially we can put n log n over here, right over here. Well, I can show something. Let's say I can show that n log n is big O of n squared. I can immediately show this. Let's try to show this. If I have n log n, I know that log n is less than and equals to c times x, or rather c times n, right? So because I know that log n is big O of x, or rather n, I keep putting n and x. If this is all n, there's no x here. I've I noticed that I've put in the n somewhere. Has been by Shut up. Okay. And so I noticed that I've put in n somewhere and x somewhere. This is all n. Let me just clarify that these are all n. This is n n squared. This is n. This is n. This is all n. Sorry about this. Okay. And so log n is big O of n. So I know for a fact that if I multiply both of these by n, then I have n log n to be less than and equals to c times n squared. And so I can assert that n log n is big O of n squared. Is everyone on board with this? n log n is big O of n squared? So that means I can put this before the quadratic polynomial. So my correct sequence, the polynomials that I will get are 8 square root n, then n log n, and then n squared. And so how many functions do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What's missing? Well, exponentials. After polynomial, we have an exponential function. So this is 1.1 to the power n. And this is the sequence of functions. Let me know if there's anything confusing in this example. <clears throat>
No questions? Yes, Daniel. To n log n is equals to log n to the power to n. Mm, yes. So why did you keep it in the middle then? Oh, because you think, so for logarithmic functions, logarithmic functions, if you have, um, the, if you're confused by the rules that logarithms are smaller than polynomials, notice that there is one essential thing, which is that this power needs to be a constant. It cannot be a variable of x. If it's a variable of x, then this rule is not guaranteed then you have to find its place in a polynomial class. So it's going to be bigger than some polynomials but smaller than the other polynomials. So S. Essentially what you will have is if you find n log n, then n log n is going to be bigger than n log n is going to be bigger than uh, n but it's going to be smaller than n squared. So because of this n, it's found its way, it's become bigger than other logarithmic functions. It's actually moved out of this class. It's moved out of this class and into this class because of that x factor that we had, this n factor. Does that make sense? It's not a pure logarithmic function anymore because the power was not a constant. Does it make no dis difference if F3 is different in both the question and the answer? What? Oh, it's 2n, you can put 2 there. 2 doesn't matter, the constant is fine. Sorry that I missed the constant. Where is it? Here it is. Uh, 2n doesn't matter, you can put a 2 here, 2 here. Constants don't matter, right? Because if I put, let's suppose if this was a uh, 2 over here, I can take this 2 and absorb it in this constant. So the constant is not C anymore, it's just C upon 2, which you can call another constant C prime. So you can put a 2 here, you can put a 2 here, it doesn't matter. The constant can be absorbed by the constant on the other side. As far as the big O notation con is concerned, you can just, because of the definition, you have a constant on the other side, the constants don't matter. You can actually just ignore the constant. Is that fine? Still slightly confused, but I'm trying to get a hold. Okay. Yeah, you'll understand it better with a few examples. I'm going to do another couple of rules now. So this was just, um, actually, I think the next rule might also help you a bit, which is, actually, it will make it clearer. So let's talk about the example that we did, n log n, is actually a combination of two functions. It's a combination of a polynomial and a logarithmic function. So let's notice two rules. The first rule is if F1 is big O, get a more bolder pen. If F1 is big O of G1 and F2 is big O of G2, then 
f1 plus f2 is big O of the maximum of g1 and g2. So f1 is a function, f1x is a function, f2x is a function, g1x is a function, g2x is a function. Then f1 plus f2, this function that you get by summing these two functions, is going to be in the big O of whatever the maximum of these two is. So if this is a logarithmic function and this is a polynomial function, then it should be in the big O of the polynomial function. Right? So for example, if I have, let's suppose f1 is x and f2 is x squared, I know that x, well, let's add a constant here, 4 here and 5 here. Then I know that 4x is big O of x. You can look at previous examples to confirm that this is true because I can just add a constant. And I know that 5x squared is big O of x squared. Then I know for a fact that 4x plus 5x squared is big O of the maximum of these two. The bigger function over here is of course x squared, so fx plus 5x squared is just big O of x squared. Your account what administrator. is this nonsense? To continue, please. Can I just mute this? Okay. All right. Uh, yes, Maham, you had a question. Yes, Jeff. until Jaffer writes his question, I'm going to explain. So if the second rule that we have is that again, if f1x is big O of g1x and f2x is big O of g2x, then f1 times f2 of x is going to be big O of g1 x times g2x. So whatever these two functions are, you just take a product. So we have, uh, let's suppose as an example, we can say let's suppose f1x was um, 5x, which we know is big O of x. And let's suppose f2x was log x whole squared which we know for a fact is big O of log x. So if f1 is big O of x and f2 is big O of log x, then I can assert that 5x times log x whole squared is big O of x log x. Actually, an even more trivial example would be if f1x is, uh, let's suppose, x, which I know is big O of x, and let's suppose f2x was log x, which I also know is big O of x, then I can assert that x log x is big O of this function times this function, which is x squared. So for multiplication, you multiply the two functions. And for addition, you find the maximum of the two functions. So in this case, we found the maximum. In this case, we found the bigger function, in the product of the function. OK, let's see the question that Jaffer was asking. Sir, will 4x not be bounded by x squared? Yes, Jaffer, a smaller polynomial is always bounded by a larger polynomial. But what we're interested in is the smallest possible one. 
right? So even though 4x is big O of x squared, you want to find the smallest class possible. So 4x is also big O of x. And let's prove this to Jaffer that 4x is big O of x. 4x is big O of x. To prove this, I need to find constants k and c such that when x is bigger than k, I need to find 4x less than and equals to c times x. And of course, over here I can pick any constant bigger than 4. So if I pick c to be 5, then I'm done. 4x is less than and equals to 5x for x greater than 1, and you're done. Even you can pick x greater than 0, you're still done, right? So 4x is definitely big O of x. Yes, you are right, 4x is also big O of x squared, but I'm interested in the smallest class that I can find. Because in terms of algorithms, you want to give as smallest bound as possible. I'm confused on how to find the smallest one. Well, if you notice this uh, sequence, let's suppose this is your sequence, right? 1 log x, xn, cx, x factorial. You will start off by saying, what's the smallest bound I can find? Can I bound it by a constant? If you can, then that's the one you pick. But if you can't, then you look at the logarithmic class. If you can bound it by a logarithmic class, great. But if you can't, then you move on to the polynomial class. Even in the polynomial class, you will try to find the smallest polynomial possible. So this polynomial class can actually be expanded as x, x1, x squared, x cubed, and so on. So you will try to find the smallest polynomial possible. If you can find the smallest possible polynomial, let's suppose you found Let's suppose you found um, it was big O of x squared. So it means your function, let's suppose I write the polynomials x, x squared, x cubed, x4. So if you found that it is big O of x squared, let's suppose it's somewhere here, then can you find a function even smaller than x squared? Can maybe between x, I know that there is x, x log x, x squared. Can you bound it by x log x? That's the question. So find the smallest bound possible. And this, of course, is done by you know trial and error and doing as little as possible. But why are you not writing 4x is big O of 5x? Because when you say 4x is less than and equals to 5x, when you pick this c and pick this k, your definition asserts that fx is big O of g of x whatever this g was and my g was this x this constant doesn't matter this constant just tells me i can find a constant such that this f can be bounded by this g does that make sense Jaffa? the constants don't matter when you write big O or something. You can look at the definition again. Yeah, you, you don't remove the constants. Notice, let me bring up the definition, right? Here it is. Where is it? Dum, dum, dum. Let's look at the definition. Here it is. So notice that in the definition, when you write f of x is less than and equal to c times g of x, you say f of x is big O of g of x. You don't care about this c. You just write that it is big O of whatever the function was. The constant doesn't matter. You don't write big f of x is big O of c times g of x, even though that is true, but you don't care about c. Does that make sense? And Dania's questions. Dumb questions, but what do we mean when we say f1 is big O of x and f2 is big O of log x? Um, which example are you referring to? Are you referring to 
this one. Let me bring up the Are you referring to this example? Five x is bigger of x and log x whole squared is bigger of log x. I just mean that I can prove using the definition that after some constant this function can overtake this function and this function can overtake this function. It's in it's upper bounded by this and this function is upper bounded by this. You're referring to all the examples and that's what we mean. We mean that we already know about these, we don't need to prove these. We found them before, we've done some examples, we found a constant k, there is some constant k and there is some constant c. That will ensure that this function can overtake this function. It's an upper bound. Okay, so let me just restate the rules again for clarity that if you have f1 plus f2, f1 plus f2, where f1 is bigger of g1 and f2 is bigger of g2, then f1 plus f2 is bigger of the maximum of g1 and g2. And when you have f1 times f2, then it is big O of g1 times g2. So these are the two rules that we have. Let me do a couple more examples with you so that you have a better understanding of what's going on. Let's say we do exercise 1 part T of your book which states the following show that 5 log x is big O of x okay so to establish this relationship what I will need to do is I will need to find some k and some c such that when x is greater than when x is greater than k i have 5 log x less than and equals to c times um, x Notice one thing that I don't care about the the true form of this is actually the absolute value is bigger than the absolute value but I don't care about the absolute value because of the fact that both of these functions are positive functions. If I, I'm only concerned if I look at x greater than 0 then this is positive, this is positive, the absolute function is not the absolute value is not going to do anything to these functions. So I can just get rid of these and so you can also get rid of these when you are dealing with just positive functions which are increasing, right? So I need to establish this relationship for some k. Okay, now I know, let's check out log x and x. I know that log x is less than x for x greater than 0. You can check this out in Desmos if you want but this is guaranteed to me that the logarithmic function is less than the linear function and so if i want 5 log x i can do the following if i multiply both of these sides by 5 log x then i know that this is less than 5 times x and so i'm done my k is 0 and my c is 5. for x greater than 0 i've shown that 5 log x is less than and equals to 5x which means I have shown thus 5 log x is big O of x
So to do this example, you only needed to know this fact. If you don't know this, then you can go to Desmos and you can check when can I have this. Does that make sense? So all you need to do is give some k and some c and you're done. Great. Okay, let's move on. Let's do another example, which is slightly more. Um, so exercise five. Exercise five says x squared plus one. Show that x squared plus 1 over x plus 1 is big O of x. So this is something that we need to show. That x squared plus 1 over x plus 1 is big O of x. So what do I need to show? To show, I need to show the following. That for x bigger than k, x squared plus 1 over x plus 1 is less than and equals to some constant c times x. This is what we have to show. We have to find a k and we have to find a c. Right? And now this is a bit confusing. How do I do this? And a good way to do this is actually to try to manipulate this inequality. If I want to show this, this inequality is actually equivalent to the inequality x squared plus 1 less than and equals to take this over there and I get c times x times x plus 1 which is simply less than and equals to c times x squared plus x. So on the left hand side you have x squared plus 1 and on the right hand side you have x squared plus x. And this is easier to do. How is this easier to do? Well, let's look at a fact. I know that x squared is equal to x squared which is a very trivial thing to say. So this is equal to this function. And I also know that 1 is less than x for all x greater than 1. This is simple to see, right? So x squared is less than and equals to x squared and 1 is less than and equals to x. So I can immediately say that when x is bigger than 1, x squared plus 1 is less than and equals to x squared plus x. And if I can say this, then I can move my inequality back x squared plus 1 less than and equals to let's take the factor that we wanted x plus 1 let's move it back x squared plus 1 over x plus 1 is less than and equals to x and now notice that if i choose c as 1 and k is 1 i am guaranteed this so for k equals 1 and c equals to 1 x greater than 1 will guarantee that x squared plus 1 over x plus 1 is less than and equals to x, basically c times x, where c was 1. So once this is true, I can assert that x squared plus 1 over x plus 1 is big O of x. Let me repeat what I just did. In initially, I said that I want to show this. And to show this, it would be enough for me to show something like this. And so this is something that I need to know. But now we can use the facts about polynomials that we know. This is something that we already know. This is true and this is true. And this is something that we already can immediately say that x squared is less than or equal to x squared and 1 is less than x. And once you have that, you just have to rearrange it to look like what you wanted to show. So I rearranged this to look like what I needed to show and I immediately have my k as 1 and c as 1. Does this example make sense? So 
here is an example exercise 9 exercise 9 it asks you to show the following show that x squared plus 4x plus 17 is big O of x cubed and x cubed is not big O of x squared plus 4x plus 17. The first part is easy and I'm going to leave it for you to do. The second part I'm going to do for you. This is an example of when we have to show that something is not the big O of anything else. So the way to prove this is we will use an approach by contradiction. So we will prove by contradiction. The proof by contradiction is as follows. Let's suppose, let's suppose that x cube is big O of x squared plus 4x x squared plus 4x plus 17. So to prove by contradiction we will Okay, so let's suppose x cube is big O of x squared plus 4x plus 17. What will this tell us? This will tell us that there exist constants k and c such that for x greater than k we have x cube less than and equals to x squared plus 4x plus 17 okay and over here actually there should be a c over here so c times x squared plus 4x plus 17 first let's look at this function x squared plus 4x plus 17 i know for a fact that this is big o of x squared this is one of the rules that we know that x squared plus 4x plus 17 is big O of x squared which means there exists another constant let's say k prime and another constant c prime such that x squared plus 4x plus 17 is less than and equals to c prime x squared. So this is something that I already know. This is something that we are getting from asserting this uh, negation of our statement. And so let's combine these two inequalities now. So I have this inequality bigger than k and this inequality holds when this is x is bigger than k prime. So for x bigger than the maximum of k and k prime, if we take the bigger of these two, then both of these inequalities will hold true. Because for this one, this inequality holds true and for this one, this inequality holds true. So if we pick the bigger constant, then both of these inequalities will hold true. So I can say x cube is less than and equals to c times x squared plus 4x plus 17, which I can replace this part by this part. So this whole thing will be less than c times c prime x squared. So what I have asserted is x cubed is less than and equals to c times c prime x squared when x is bigger than this constant, this maximum constant. Right? But over here we are going to have a contradiction. Let's suppose we divide x squared over there then we get x is less than and equals to c dot c prime. And if you think about this, this is a contradiction. This is a contradiction because it's saying that even though your x is bigger than some constant, there is also some constant that it's going to be less than and equals to for all these possible cases. So let's suppose we had, this was the maximum of k and k prime and let's suppose 
this was c dot c prime what these two inequalities are actually contradictions because the first inequality is saying that for all values of x bigger than this and the second value is asserting the second inequality is asserting that x is actually smaller than this constant and these two inequalities are contradicting each other and hence we have a contradiction that on the one hand you're asserting that x can be bigger as bigger as possible than this constant but at the second you're asserting that x is actually smaller than this constant and so since we've got into a contradiction we know that our first statement cannot be true therefore x cubed is not big O of x squared plus 4x plus 17. So that ends the proof by contradiction. Everyone understood this proof by contradiction? Okay, great. Excellent. Okay, so now that we're done with this, these examples, hopefully these concepts are a bit more um, understandable to you. I will now bring up the last two concepts before we end this section. So the ideas are very similar now that we have a grasp of the big O notation. The next two ideas are actually quite similar. The first idea is that of the big omega notation and big omega Dania was telling me that in the last video I kept calling this omega as theta this is omega not theta I apologize for saying it wrong so big omega is actually very similar to the big O function we say f1 f of x is big O of g of x if x greater than k if for all x bigger than k we have f of x the absolute value of f of x not less than but actually bigger than some constant times g of x so what this is saying is that g of x is a lower bound for f of x so in terms of algorithm in terms of algorithms we have when we say that this is a lower bound we say that if my running time is bounded below by some polynomial so let's suppose I say uh, my execution time of the algorithm execution time of the algorithm is bounded below by a polynomial then it means that it's going to run faster than polynomial time sorry run slower so my algorithm runs slower than linear polynomial so if I assert these two together, so if I say f of x is big O of x squared and f of x is big omega of x, then what I'm saying that it's faster than a quadratic polynomial but slower than a linear polynomial. So it's faster than quadratic time but it's slower than linear time. And at this point, we can introduce the next notation, which is big theta notation. And big theta actually says both of these things. So f of x is big theta of g of x if both of these things hold true. The first thing is if f of x 
is big O of g of x and f of x is also big omega of g of x. <clears throat> so if it's bounded above and bounded below by the same function, the same reference function, and that's possible if you can find these two definitions, of course the constants may be different, but if your function is bounded above by this function and it's bounded below by this function, then we say f of x is big theta of g of x. And it's also called that f of x is the same order as g of x. So when we talk about the order of a function, it's in the same order as the other function if you can show both of these conditions. Does that make sense? Okay, Tanya says, Jafar says, Sir, ye itna mushkil kyu hai? Because uh, life is sometimes difficult, Jafar. Tanya says, in continuation to Jafar's question, how can someone drop a very, very, very coarse? I don't know what you mean by a very, very, very coarse. Maybe you mean a very, very difficult course, in which case uh, you can refer to the program department. Jafar, DM mein koi bhi topic aasaan nahi hai. Hmm. It's, that's the marking of a good course when it's not easy. But if you have any questions that relate to these uh, two notions that I've just introduced, please let me know. Let me zoom out a bit so that you can see more of the screen. Hmm. I should have done this before. Yes, okay. Any questions? Sir, ye big theta dubara kar dein, bilko samaj nahi aaya. Jafar, big theta is nothing new. Big theta is just combining these two properties, big O and big omega. So, for example, um, as an example, I can say that x squared is big O, 5x squared is big O of x. And 5x squared is also big omega, sorry, big O of x squared. And it's also big omega of x squared. I can find constants such that uh, 5x squared is less than and equals to some cx squared. And I can also find a constant such that 5x squared is bigger than some constant times x squared. So this is, let's suppose, c1 and c2. I can prove both of these for some k1 and k2. If I can prove both of these and I'm claiming that I can, then I know that 5x squared is big O of x squared and 5x squared is also big omega of x squared, which means the upper bound is also the quadratic function and the lower bound is also the quadratic function. And since it's the same function, then I can say 5x squared is big theta of x squared, that is, it's in the same class as quadratic functions, which is a trivial thing to say, but we still state it. That means it only works for same class? Uh, yes. Actually, you can uh, do a more complicated example as well. For example, uh, let's say you have a combination function. Let's say, for example, you have 5x squared plus x log x plus 3x right this is a combination function and i know that this is big o this thing is big o of x squared this thing is big o of um, dum, 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 of x log x and this thing is big o of x so as a whole, you can say that 5x squared plus x log x 
plus 3x is big O of x squared because they are being added together. So you will take the maximum of these functions and I know the maximum of these three functions is x squared. So 5x squared plus x log x plus 3x is big O of x squared. Now we would say that it is big theta if we also had that 5x squared plus x log x plus 3x is big omega of x squared. And if it's bounded below by the x squared function, then you can know for a fact, then if this is true, then we can say that 5x squared plus x log x plus 3x is big theta of x squared. So to assert this, we need to show this. And I'm not sure if that's true. Will this be bounded below by x squared? Let's see, can we show that? So we'll need to show that for some x greater than k, 5x squared plus x log x plus 3x is uh, bigger than c times x squared. And maybe we can do that. How can we do that? Let's say if we, if I get rid of 5x squared plus x log x plus 3x, then if I get rid of these two functions, then I know that this is bigger, greater than or equal to 5x squared because I've just removed something. So the resultant function will be smaller, right? So since the resultant function is smaller, I can, I can say that this thing is big, o, big omega of x squared. And therefore, I have that this whole function that I had, f of x, let's call this f of x, then f of x is big theta of x squared. That is the same order as a quadratic function. <clears throat> sure. So what we were saying that let me just repeat the whole thing. So I wanted to see if this was big theta of x squared. I first showed that this is bounded above by x squared and I also tried to show that it's bounded below. It's easy to see that it's bounded above because this is x squared, x log x, x, and we take the maximum of these functions. And the way to show that this is bounded below by x squared is to show this condition that for x is greater than k, this is the definition of being bounded below by something that 5x squared plus x log x plus 3x is going to be bigger than c times x squared. The way to do that is when we do, when we try to show big O, we try to make these functions bigger. When we try to show big omega, we try to make this whole expression smaller. To make it smaller, I remove this part and I remove this part. If I remove something positive from my function, then I know for a fact that this thing is going to be bigger than this thing because this is the same except some extra part removed. So this part has to be smaller than this part. And if that's true, then I know that C is equal to five. And I've shown that this is big omega of x squared and I can assert that it's in the big theta of x squared. Why is x log x big O of itself? Because, let's answer Danya's question. Because we know, Danya asked why is x log x is big O of x log x? This is true for any function, firstly. fx is always big O of f of x. But you can think about this in terms of something else as well. You can think about this as a product of two functions. This is f of x and this is g of x. Where fx is x and g of x is log x, they are being multiplied. And again, because each function is big O of itself, I know that x is big O of x and log x is big O of log x. If you want to see this, you can always say f of x is always less than and equals to f of x. This is always true. Because if less than is not true, this equality is true. 
So this holds for all C and all K. So X log X is big of X log X through this logic, as well as if you take the product, X is big O of X and G is big O of log X. Therefore, X times log X is big O of X log X. Lekin bigo hota kaha hai. What do you mean hota kaha hai? So, ye hota hai jab aap algorithms ki research karte ho aur aap koi algorithm suggest karte ho, searching algorithm, sorting algorithm, and you try to bound your functions to the smallest possible function that you can find. So that you can say ki achha mere algorithm ka upper bound ye hai running time ka aur lower bound ye hai running time ka. And that's how you know okay, how fast or slow your algorithm is. So when you do an advanced course on algorithm, design of algorithms, uh, analysis and design of algorithms, I'm not sure if you have that course in IBA. But if you do that, then you heavily use these notations, big O, big omega, big theta. Because you want to find some um, idea of, you want to have some idea of how fast or how slow your algorithm is. So I think that's all for if that's clear and if there are no more questions then I can actually end today's session. So we're done with this section entirely. You can do some exercises. I have received uh, your next assignment from your teaching assistant and I will review it and I will hopefully post it today. So if I forget to post it, remind me, I will post it. And if you have any other queries, let me know. Can we use limits to prove in exercise 9 part 2? Definitely you can use any limiting technique that you know. Question 9 part 2 was, uh, where was it? I think it's behind this. Nope. Where's nine part two? Okay, here it is. So yes, the answer is the short answer is yes. You can use any limiting techniques, but be careful about your uh, reasoning. <laughs> yes, you would like that, wouldn't you? But make sure, Manahil, that your argument makes sense. If you want to show bigger, then uh, limit should be limit should go to infinity. If you want to show smaller, then limit should go to zero. So it's okay if you forget. <laughs> yes, I know, I'm aware, but I would rather not. Java <laughs> subsidy. Okay. Any other questions? Ah, ye Jafar Jesse logo te, so get the Gujatane, Pura Kirkebet Jate. Okay, great. Let me know if there's any other questions. I'll stay online for a few minutes. If there are no questions, I'll move ahead and end the stream. Comments ki video banali mene. Sir, I haven't touched TM since when IB got closed. Well, now this would be, that's fine, but this would be a good time to start again. I took one week of downtime as well. It's fine to take a break. Jafar, what's up? Online, I was in class. Ke <laughs> okay, I don't care. This video, I will post this video. I will trim out the parts that were. Uh, I'll trim this video so that I get rid of the unnecessary parts and then I'll just upload it on YouTube so you can watch it whenever you want. And the people who were not online today, which I'm guessing are a lot because I only see 14 people, 
so I'm guessing lots of people will be watching the video so I'll just uh, change it okay so one hour 30 minutes are in no more questions should we end the stream Problem also, no problem, Abdul Khan. Abdul Khan, I don't remember that name in the class attendance. What's your full name? Abdul Rahman. Sadam, thanks. No problem, no problem. Lit. I'm glad uh, helping. by the way a quick question you are all okay with the audio and video setup right do you think there's anything else that i can improve on in these videos if there is some improvement that can be made let me know i think i'm satisfied with this uh, setup but if you think that there's something that can be fixed let me know so my revise around good yes okay perfect if I have questions for this topic yes Hamza you can always email me or post the question rather post the questions on um, um, what piazza and I can answer over there other people can answer over there uh, Jaffer, I don't want to do it recorded because it's. I think this is better. At least I get some feedback while I'm teaching. If I record a ghante ka or a ghante ka lecture, I don't know if you guys are understanding or not. So a little bit of feedback helps me, and it will help you as well. A bit of volume increase, sure. We can check the. I try to do an audio check before the starting the session. So. I'll check it again next time. Sir, pass fail wala hoga. I'm not sure, Jafar. Um, that depends on. So, oh yes, uh, Dr. Saeed Ghani reminded me to tell you all that there will be a meeting tomorrow of the academic committee where they will decide about examinations and grades and midterms. So, pass fail wala bhi, it will be discussed tomorrow. So, uh, you will get to know tomorrow, hopefully, or soon after the meeting, if there is any decision taken about that. Um, Subhan, I uh, hope I'm not sure that the syllabus complete hoga ke nahi hoga. I want to do as much as possible, but if it's not possible, then I will obviously uh, trim the material a bit. I'll see what we can live without and trim the uh, syllabus as much as possible without ruining the integrity of the course. I want you people to uh, at least learn what we were set out to learn in the course. I don't want to compromise on that but if if you know um, we are forced to reduce something at least I'll make sure that I teach as much as possible if I feel that I can't assess you on all the topics maybe I'll just remove some topics from the examination in whatever form of examination we'll have which might be a good point to discuss your midterm uh, do you have any suggestions on what to do about your midterm I have some ideas I'm thinking about making you people do some project rather than give you an exam or which is like an assignment but if you think you have some idea which might be better let me know otherwise I'll just uh, impose whatever I feel is nice I'll give you a two three week period to write a project on some topic from the course projects I know sounds weird for a math course but uh, I think a written project would be uh, a written project on any research project where you take a topic let's suppose uh, big O notation complexity and you 
research a bit on how it's used in advanced classes, how it's used in algorithm research, and you write a report on some detailed mathematics, perhaps. If you can explain something new, a bit more um, idea about any topic that we've done, go into a bit more depth. That's the kind of project that I would be looking for. But the idea is it the way I want it to be a assessment is I want all of these projects to be original. They will be individual projects and they will be original projects so that I know that everyone has done uh, their project themselves. And so there will be some points for originality. There will be some points for um, picking a difficult topic. There will be some point for giving, uh, like taking, explaining something that is, I don't know, maybe something cool, something um, a bit more depth. If you try to tackle something mathematically advanced, that would be even better. So yeah, something like that. I won't make it too difficult. It just needs to be, I will, perhaps I can give you a sample project of what it can look like. Something uh, interesting. Teachers. Okay. Yes, a little bit dangerous is good. It will make you learn. But if you have an alternate that could be better than that, then maybe you can suggest something. But so far, I'm quite happy with the project idea. No, Manahil, everything is not included. Your first reference for what is included is the book. So your book and whatever my lectures are, they are your primary resource. The reason I posted those MIT videos is sometimes I feel they do a better job of explaining. I wanted to post the easier videos that were from Kimberly Brin, but she did not cover this big O notation and big omega notation. So what you need to do is uh, look at those MIT videos, look at what's relevant and same as what I'm teaching. And if there's any extra material, it's good for you to understand. But if you don't understand, then you don't need to worry about it. So I got the same question from you yesterday and Manahil as well. Oh, sorry, Maham as well. And the answer is the same, that don't worry about the extra stuff. Just worry about what's same and just um, try to understand that. And if it's not helpful, you can ignore the MIT video and just focus on my videos. Cool, that's nice. Can you please teach algorithm of task scheduling? Um, I posted a video by Kimberly Brand, right? Wasn't it helpful in teaching task scheduling? Jaffer, maybe your project can be on task scheduling. Okay, I will bring up a pseudocode. I can make a video perhaps, or maybe I can discuss the pseudocode in the next uh, class. Let's see if I can, uh, Jaffer, if you know programming, maybe you can write a program yourself and try to do task scheduling. <laughs> okay, fine, I'm just joking, relax. I can make a video uh, on, maybe I can write an algorithm and show it the way I showed the other sorting and searching algorithms. I'll see if I get the time to do that. Okay. All right, so that's it, I guess. Should we call this a day? Okay, great. Thank you everyone for attending and yeah, have a good day. Let's 
try to get back in the rhythm uh, just before you go there will be another class on Wednesday so I'm now going to follow the regular schedule Monday Wednesday 1230 because it's a uh, middle of both of your time schedules so slot one slot two so I'll keep it at 1230 and it will probably run till 2 to 30 hopefully not longer than two one hour 30 minutes I'm allowing some extra 15 minutes for audio and buffering time but it does it be similar to your regular class schedule at IBA okay fine have a good day bye bye